Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. A short but very interesting discussion on, on the part of Descartes takes place in part five of his Discourse on Metaphysics. And it has to do with the relationship between human beings, animals, and machines. And this, this comes out of a long tradition of, of saying that, that human beings are fundamentally different than the other animals in that we possess rationality. And because of possessing rationality, we exist at a higher level than, than they do. And, and this can be parsed out in many different ways. Descartes introduces another wrinkle into this, which makes good sense given his metaphysics, in talking about machines. And why does he bring this in? What, what's the context here? So he's actually discussing in part five a book that he didn't publish called The World. And he's telling us about the different things that he, he uh, went over in that. Um, in the course of that discussion, which is quite long and we're not going to get to most of it, he tells us about how he was you know, setting out for us a theory of the relationship between body and mind or brain, body, and what at that time they were calling the animal spirits. And the view that they had in the physiology of that time is that there were various uh, uh, fluids, we can call them, that moved around in our body called the animal spirits. And these were largely responsible for sensation, consciousness in terms of the body itself, not, not in terms of the mind, uh, but in terms of the, the, the body's contribution to it, movement, uh, affections, all, all those sorts of things. Now, we don't actually use that anymore. We talk instead of you know, biological processes that are chemical or electrical, but it's really the same idea that there's, we've got a body, part of that body is the brain, and there's all sorts of things going on within various systems, and then these produce the states of consciousness that we have. So he says that, you know, I, I had explained all these matters. Um, I'd shown what structure the nerves, the muscles ha must have in order to enable the animal spirits to have the power to move its members. Um, he talks about which changes must occur in the brain to cause states of waking, sleeping, dreaming, how light, sound, smells, taste, all other qualities can imprint various ideas through the, the intermediary of the senses, how hunger, thirst, and other internal passions can transmit ideas to the brain. So he's very interested in this question. And then he brings something up that, that's quite interesting. He says, um, all of this is not going to appear at all strange to a certain kind of people, people who are well-informed. Well-informed about what? He says, those who know how wide a range of different automata, that is self-moving mechanisms or moving machines, the skill of a human being can make only using a very few parts if we compare that now to this complex machine that is the body, Descartes says, and we think about the infinite maker of it, in this case, God, right? He says, then you're going to understand this is an incredibly complex machine. He says, they will consider this body as a machine, which having been made by the hand of God, is in comparably better order and has in itself more amazing movements than any that can be created by man. So he's bringing up a very interesting point here, is he not? Which is, we human beings create machines. We are, in effect, the, the animal that makes machines, right? And then we ourselves, at least in terms of our body, 
are machines created by a decorator maker. So are we maybe just machines then? There's the, the key question. That's the, the context that's setting this. So he says, um, I dwelt on this issue to show that if there were such machines having organs and outward shape of different things, we would interpret them in different ways. What are the different things in this case? So the question is, could machines created by human beings replicate living beings? And at, at the time that Descartes is writing this, of course, you know, mechanics is rather underdeveloped in comparison to today. And if you think about the, the amazing advances that we have made in robotics, in artificial intelligence, in, in just you know, reducing the size of electrical circuits down to uh, very, very small uh, entities, and even in what we call machine learning, perhaps it's not the best term given what Descartes has to say here because perhaps machines don't actually learn in a significant sense. But if you think about how we represent these things to ourselves, is this more plausible today that machines could in fact replicate living beings? You know, we make science fiction stories and movies about this sort of thing. We even have a word, replicant, coming, of course, from uh, Philip K. Dick's Blade Runner, where we're talking about an artificial human being made by human beings. So this is a, a very live issue. Descartes says, well, when it comes to animals, just plain old animals, take us out of the equation. The answer is yes. Now, there wasn't a possibility at his own time, and it may not, in fact, be a possibility yet for us, but if we adopt the Cartesian perspective on animals, which is essentially that they already are just meat and bone and nerve machines, they don't have anything besides that, then the answer is yes, we could create new machines like those. As a matter of fact, the entire bodily process of reproduction, you know, of, of cells reproducing by using their genetic material to create new cells and all that, merely mechanical processes as far as Descartes is concerned. What about human beings? Can we create something that would mimic a human being so successfully that eventually we would have to say, well, it really is a, a human being. What if we took the human body and we mapped it out perfectly? And then we constructed a machine on, on that basis. He says, if there were machines having the organs and outward shape of a monkey or any other irrational animal, we would have no means of knowing they were not of exactly the same nature as those animals. Whereas if any machines resembled us in body and imitated our actions insofar as this was practically possible, that's a key line, insofar as this was practically possible, which nowadays covers an awful lot, we would still have two, he says, very certain means of recognizing that they were not human beings. Now, these are also ways of recognizing that animals, other animals, the brute animals, as they would have called them back then, are not the same as human beings either. You know, we might say, in addition to something like a Turing test, maybe there could be an animal version where a very, very smart chimpanzee, you know, either can or can't fool us into thinking that it's a, a human being or, you know, cetacean of some sort, or an octopus, or pick whatever you like. So what are the key differences? It's not enough just to say, oh, well, we're rational animals, and the other animals are not rational. What does that rationality actually consist in? What does that mean? You can't just invoke it. That's not solving the issue. So Descartes here is thinking about something that's really at the core of our rational nature. The first sign that he talks about is using language or other modes of signs, as he says. And it's not enough just to be able to, you know, say Polly wants a cracker or something like that, or for, I don't know, you're, you're, there's these funny YouTube videos where a dog is, you know, going, raw, 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 and people are saying, oh, it sounds like I love you, right? 
Um, for Descartes, all those sorts of things are just signals rather than signs, as we might say. They don't signify thoughts. They don't signify something new. So he says, um, the first criterion is that these machines would never be able to use words or other signs. Now, it doesn't stop there because I know some people are going to object and say, wait a second, Siri uses words and signs all the time or Alexa or whoever, whatever personal assistant you have on your phone or your, your laptop or you know, whatever other mechanism you have. Right. Siri or whatever other thing we can think of in this way, going all the way back to Eliza, the, one of the first artificial intelligence programs, which wasn't really artificial intelligence, but was set to mimic human beings, says things. But are they really saying things in the same way? So he goes on and he says, um, composing these signs as we do to declare our thoughts to others. Is an artificial construct actually declaring its thoughts? It's doing what its programming tells it to do, but it doesn't actually have thoughts on its own that it wants to convey to us. As a matter of fact, this is something really worth dwelling upon. Thoughts for Descartes covers a wide range. It's not just propositions like, you know, the cat is on the table or it's time now to feed the dog, or, or things along those lines. My <laughs> dog has a real interest in telling you it's time to feed the dog, doesn't it? It also includes, you know, conveying desires, um, trying to act on, on other things, right? Thoughts covers a, a wide range. So he says, um, we can well conceive of a machine made in such a way that it emits words and even utters them about bodily actions, which bring about some corresponding change in his organs. So you touch it on a certain spot, he says. Uh, it'll ask what we want. If you touch it somewhere else, it'll cry out that we're hurting it. You know, again, think about you know, these, these personal assistants that we have that are AIs. You can, you can uh, ask them kind of funny questions, and they give funny answers. But they're not really conscious. They're just following programming. It's not like they come up with you know, original uh, meanings or, or, or you know, locutions of their own. So he says, um, it's not conceivable that the machine would put these words into different orders to correspond to the meaning of things set in its presence. And this is something that we notice, even Descartes says, the most dull-witted person can do. So there's a sense in which language isn't just about having a code where things mean things. It's also about a productive capacity to use language to say something new. That's very important. Now, can animals do something like that? Descartes would say no. Perhaps this is something where we would want to look more carefully at animal behavior and our contemporary theories about it. But at least for where Descartes is, he's saying, no, they can't do that. The other key criterion here of what it means to be rational and how we can tell machines that are imitating human beings apart from human beings or animals that would in some way be portrayed as being human has to do, he says, with a capacity to do many things you might talk about this in terms of what we call transfer from one domain to another. This is why we can actually learn, why we have the flexibility to move from one context to the next, to the next, to the next. So he says, although such machines, machines designed to imitate human beings, might do many things as well or even better than any of us, they would inevitably fail to do some others by which we would discover they did not act consciously, but only because their organs were disposed in a certain way. Their organs being essentially their programming, right? He says, uh, we, can, we can take a machine and it could be really, really good at one thing or maybe 10 things, but it's not going to be equally good at everything else. This is an interesting criterion to bring up, isn't it? In our own time, when we have these incredibly powerful computers that now are doing many things quite well, 
Descartes is saying that you're never going to have a computer that does everything that a human being can do well. Now, he doesn't go into any great detail about this, but we might think about difficult things that are, in some respect, difficult to explain, and, and at least for some people difficult, but which don't seem to be too hard for most of us, but would be hard for um, a machine to do, even with the best mimicking programming. Showing empathy to another person. Is that something that a robot who's great at putting together cars is going to be able to do? Well, I mean, these are open questions that we can ask about. Descartes thinks from, from his own time that this is not, this is not going to be possible for a machine. It's also not possible for an animal. Animals uh, do some things very well. There's other things that they, they don't do well or that they can't even do at all. He goes on and he says something that really helps to inform all of this. Reason, he says, is a universal instrument. Reason is able to extend to, in, in theory, just about anything that we human beings can come across. He says, um, reason is a, is a universal instrument which can operate in all sorts of situations. Machines, however, whether we think about it in terms of organs or programming, are designed for certain things. So he says it's practically possible for there to be enough different organs in a machine to cause it to act in all life's occurrences in the same way that our reason causes us to act. Now this is assuming, of course, that we're being reasonable, that we're not just following our own programming coming to us from our society or our, our genetics or whatever, and, and largely oriented by the imagination, as, as Descartes would say, and habit. So he says we can determine the difference between men and animals in this way. He says there's, there's a very remarkable fact. There are no human beings so dull-witted and stupid, not even madmen, that they're incapable of stringing together different words and composing them into utterances, uh, even if they're crazy talk. And he says, um, this, this is not just a matter of organs. Magpies, parrots can talk like we do, but it's not really talking as such. It's not communication. And he says, this shows us animals don't just have less reason, less rationality than human beings. They don't have any at all. They're just essentially machines. And um, he goes on to say that Animals show more skill in some of their actions than we do. You know, dogs are great at, say, sniffing out uh, you know, uh, drugs or something. Right? Pigs sniff out truffles. Our noses are actually rather underdeveloped by, by relation. But we can do so many other things that they can't do, including domesticating the dogs and farming and eating the pigs. Right? So they're, and using them to, to find truffles and using them to find drugs. Yeah, it wouldn't have occurred to them on, on their own, most likely. So... This is really an interesting issue. And I think in our own time, just to bring this to a close, we might want to call Descartes into question on this and say, couldn't machines at, at some point pass a threshold where they, they would be able to do this and would be rational? Might animals not participate, at least certain higher animals, to a certain degree in this? If that's the case, then Descartes would actually be wrong, at least in part. Perhaps Descartes is right, though, and perhaps we are the only creatures that we encounter so far that are capable of this, in which case we would be able to tell human beings apart from machines designed to imitate and act like human beings.